Hey, church family. Hope you're all doing well and staying safe and healthy. And so good to be with you again on this Wednesday as we get together for a little midweek Bible study and and devotion. And over the last couple of weeks and heading into Christmas, we've been in a study where we're looking at uh, the words of the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 9, uh, verses 6 and 7, where he gives four names, four descriptions of what the coming Messiah will be. And certainly we already have received that Messiah in Jesus, but this was written 700 years before uh, Jesus was born. But in it, he gives these four descriptions, four wonderful descriptions for what Jesus is, what he would be, and what he is for us even still today. So let's read the passage and then we'll talk about it a little bit more. So Isaiah chapter 9, starting in verse 6. Here's what Isaiah writes. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Well, so far in our study, we've talked about Jesus as our wonderful counselor. That's what we talked about the first week. Last week, we talked about Jesus as our mighty God. And today we come to Isaiah's third name, third description for the Messiah, for Jesus, and that is everlasting Father. You know, few words in any language evoke the kind of feelings we have when we hear the word Father. Certainly some of us will feel a loss this Christmas season, either because we had fathers who were wonderful but are no longer with us, or because we have unfulfilled longings for the kind of father that we never had or experienced. How comforting then it ought to be to know that we have an everlasting father under whose care and protection and provision we find safety and satisfaction both here and now and forever on into eternity. And yet the reality is that we probably don't often connect that characteristic as much to Jesus, though. It's really more of a characteristic we attribute to God, the Father. And so of all the names attributed to Jesus in Isaiah chapter 9, Everlasting Father is perhaps the most intriguing because it's probably the one that's hardest to wrap our minds around. I mean, how can Jesus, the Messiah, the Son, be called Everlasting Father? How can he be both Father and Son? Well, for starters, A, I'm not going to be able to explain all of it. I'm not sure I could anyways, even if I had all the time in the world, but uh, in, a, in a short little period, I can't explain all of it, so I'm just do my best to, to at least cover the highlights. Uh, but for starters, understand that G- or Isaiah isn't confusing Jesus the Son, the Messiah, with God the Father. He's, he's not confusing the two of them. Now, I don't want to get too much into a side discussion here uh, on the Trinity or the Godhead, because we could talk about that for weeks. But I'll just say that God the Father and Jesus the Son and the Holy Spirit, they are all one. They are all unified. They are all God, but they are also their own entity, their own being, their own person. And I know that's hard for us to wrap our minds around. And again, we don't have time to, to discuss all of that today, but I at least want to point that out, that they are all one, but they are also their own entity. Again, hard to wrap our minds around, but at least wanted to point that out to help hopefully somewhat clarify what Isaiah is talking about here. And so Isaiah isn't teaching us that God the Son is the same person as God the Father. In fact, I, I don't think Isaiah specifically has the Trinity or the Godhead in mind here when he says that the Messiah will be called everlasting father. You see, the symbolic use of the Hebrew word father, certainly it was, you know, in in the literal sense, a, a father, a, you know, one who gives offspring, you know, and then has children. Um, but the, the symbolic use of that word father was an expression for possessor of, meaning that Jesus became, God became a child in time, you know, through his birth, but he is the father, he is the possessor of eternity. And so it's not the Messiah's role within the Trinity or the Godhead, but the Messiah's character toward us that Isaiah really has in mind here. 
Isaiah is, is highlighting the divine nature of the Messiah. And more than any other uh, author, Isaiah loved to speak of eternity. In Isaiah chapter 57, he speaks of God as the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity and whose name is holy. And here in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, he, he uses the same type of language to refer to the Messiah. He is, as Revelation chapter 1 verse 8 says, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who is and was and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, just think about that for a moment. Isaiah is speaking of a child who will be born some 700 years in the future from the time he's writing this, and yet he makes clear that this child is the author, the possessor, the father of eternity. I mean, that just blows my mind. And so when it comes to the Messiah's character toward us, Isaiah is, is pointing us to the fact that Jesus the Messiah is the only one who can reveal God's fatherly character to us because he is the one, he's the only one who is in nature and, and essence one with the Father. Now, Isaiah certainly couldn't have seen the full light of glory that shone from Jesus when he dwelt among us, but from Jesus' own lips, words such as these were spoken in John chapter 10 when he says, I and the Father are one. Know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. He says to Philip in John chapter 14 verses 9 and 10, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen the Father, or whoever has seen me, has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Because that's the question that, that Philip asked of him. How can you say, show us the Father, Jesus says? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Jesus, our everlasting Father, is a tangible, relatable reflection of our Heavenly Father. If you want to know what God is like, Look at Jesus. Jesus is the perfect image of God and the exact representation of his being. Jesus alone makes the Father known. Jesus even goes to far, as far as to say in John chapter 14, verse 6, that not only does he represent, or not as he the perfect image of the Father, but no one can come to the Father except through him. I like how one writer just very succinctly put it. He said, Jesus takes away our guilt and again, opens the way to God's fatherly heart. I love that. He takes away our guilt and again, opens the way to God's fatherly heart. Everything you've dreamed a father could be, everything you've wanted, ever wanted from your relationship with your heavenly father, Jesus is and will be for you. Your Messiah will forever be perfectly father-like in the way he shepherds and leads you. In Jesus, you have a perfect father forever. Sadly, though, as I alluded to earlier, the word father doesn't always bring to mind someone who shepherds and affirms and stays close. Instead, for many, it brings to mind adjectives that are far less positive, and that's true even among far too many Christian families, but not so when it comes to Jesus. He is our everlasting Father who came down into a broken and sinful world to fill our hearts with heaven's love and to teach us how to love one another. He came to make sons and daughters, get this, to make sons and daughters of his enemies. And this is the Father's gift to us at Christmas. So how comforting it ought to be for us to read, His name shall be called Everlasting Father. Because once we become a child of Christ, we are His and He is ours forever. There will be no goodbyes with Him. As Romans chapter 8 says, there is nothing in all creation that will be able to separate us from His love. Not even death itself. Indeed, it will only draw us nearer to him. I like how one writer put it. He said, there is no unfathering Christ and there is no unchilding us. He is a everlastingly a father to those who trust in him. 
Praise God for our eternal security in Christ, our everlasting Father. And so this Christmas, may we turn our thoughts toward him and lean into the arms of our everlasting Father. Let him comfort you and care for you. Trust in him, knowing that he is always faithful and he is always there with you no matter what you're going through. The more time you spend with him, the everlasting father becomes even more familiar and more comforting so that when you go to him, you can approach him with confidence and without a doubt, know that you are seen, heard, and loved so very much. I hope you have a blessed day. God bless.